It's about the opportunity that we give for God to work in our lives. And it's such a complex thing that every time I say it, it baffles me to think that we are the ones who give an opportunity to God to work in our lives. But I think that the intelligence that each one of us have this morning is to express the fact that there are things that God would desire to do in our lives, but there are times and moments when we don't allow it to happen because we don't act on what God desires to do in our lives. And there can be many different reasons why that happens. And I'm not going to try to, over, the, over this series, to talk about every single reason of why that would happen. But I understand that God operates in time, in this space that we take up in life. I understand that each one of us have the equal amount of it, that no one gets more time and no one gets less time. We can say in a lot of things about life, this is the only fair thing. Some people have more family, some people have more money, some people have less of those. But everyone has the same equal amount of time. And I think in a lot of ways, we would feel like it's the one thing we're robbed the most of. That as the seasons come and go in our lives, as, as, as young parents to parents of teenagers, to parents that are empty nesters that send their kids off, or you simply have been invested in, in schooling and then you start your career and you get to where you are now by all the things that you've said yes to, but now you've said yes to so many things that your life is chaotic and you feel like it's one big rat race and you feel like everything that you're doing and everything that's happening is pulling you a thousand different directions, that you feel like you're good at a lot of things, but you're not great at any one thing. And it breeds frustration and it breeds confusion. And you start feeling like you're a failure as a husband or a failure as a wife or a failure as a parent or a failure as a Christian because you haven't given the proper amount of time. And you start carrying all of these feelings and these emotions of things in your life of this false guilt as if God ever says to us, you've prayed enough today. Do you think there's ever a moment where God says to us, hey, you have prayed enough today, son, that's all I can handle. Do you think God ever says, look, look, you, I mean, you know, and, and, you, and you cried a little, and you shouted a little, and you, and you wept some more, and, and you've got the four checklist things that I require. Out of, no, he doesn't do that. But it's about the opportunity for us to connect to our Heavenly Father. And so in the time and the opportunity that we have, I think it's important for us to discuss this morning that it is a good thing in our lives whenever something happens and God brings a miracle in our lives and we can say something like, well, it's about time. Whenever you see, in the old school church, they would say it this way. They would say, oh, the Lord has, you know, he, he's never been late, but he sure missed a lot of opportunities to be early. But he's always been right on time. I can attribute for my life and for April's life that there have been times and seasons where God showed up just in time. In seasons where I didn't understand what was taking place. I didn't understand. And you know what? I think sometimes we get confused because we think we're supposed to know everything. But then we have to be reminded we're not God. And we don't know everything. That we, If we prophesy, we prophesy in part. We see through a glass dimly. We don't know the future. We're just in this moment looking through a hole in the fence Hope, and when all we see is right now, but God sees the past, the present, and the future all at one time. And if we did that, it would be confusing. If you were to look back over the last 10 years of your life and say, this is where I knew exactly that I would end up. If God had shown you this 10 years ago, some of you would have said, I can't believe it because I don't deserve it. Some of you would say, I'll never do that with my life. Some of you will say, no. No, that's not me. You got somebody else. And some of you, it may drive crazy because if you understood the blessing that God was bringing your way, it may bring arrogance, make you conceited, or it may absolutely drive you to a place of rejection because you yourself don't feel worthy enough for what God's going to do. As a new Christian, an individual that I worked for who was a mentor in my life for a short time said, Johnny, if God showed you everything he has for you, you would go crazy. I'm like, no, I don't think so. I'd like to try it. But the hard part is this. Is if I backed up 18 and a half years, almost 19 years now, and he had shown me I ever had the opportunity and the privilege to be a pastor, I would have said, Lord, you've lost your mind. But you can't talk to God that way. <laughs> and then what you ultimately realize is God knows best. And did you realize that God knew 
the season and the time in which you would be living? That he understood the season and the time in which you would raise your family? He understood the season and the time of what you would encounter and everything that would happen to you, for you, what people would say about you, that there's not one thing that has ever taken him by surprise. But in our humanity, we like to control things. And so if we're going to talk about time, I think it's important for us to look at biblical terms of how time is defined. One is this. It's, it's, the, it's the biblical word chronos. And chronos is governed linear. It is chronological time. For the most part, this is how we operate. You have a calendar. You have an appointment book. When you schedule a doctor's appointment, what do you do? You go, you look at each other's, they tell you a time, you agree, and you sign up, and you set up reminders now with electronic opportunities, with, with, tech, with technology the way that it is. We get 14 reminders, and we have people that remind us about our appointments. You get calls the day before. This is the chronology of time. We understand that these things are going to happen at a certain time. We know that football season is upon us. Why? Because chronologically, every year it happens. Man, and, and by the way, is Troy not awesome? <laughs> Man, that team is good. <laughs> I want to thank every one of you for your faithfulness to text me yesterday evening. <laughs> yes, I saw it too. <laughs> and I watched the press conference because I wanted to hear him talk like, well, we got to look at leadership. And, yeah, I want to hear him say, cause, and it's not that we don't like Troy. It's just that now we may never beat a team in Alabama again. So <laughs> there's... Maybe we can schedule South, but who knows? <laughs> Maybe. And you say, so you can literally say about things that you don't understand and things that you want to play in football season. Then you know the spring's coming. You know the different schedules that come along with it. We operate in the chronological order of time. For example, in the calendar, it's fall. Officially. I need, so I need fall, I need the calendar to explain to the sweat that I gave up yesterday that it is supposed to be that hot right now. We operate in the chronological order. It's the same thing. Well, you know, winter's going to go. We look at the shadow of it. We operate in the chronological order of time. It's our humanity. We like to set dates. We like to set times. And sometimes it happens, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have to postpone things. We operate as humans in the chronos. It's our timing, our planning, and when we need it to happen. But there's another definition of time in the Bible, and it's the kairos of time. See, we operate in the chronos, and the kairos of time is simply defined as the indeterminate moment that is right for something to occur. And it's been my experience that in the chronos of time of how I plan things, that no matter what date that I set, that God operates not on the chronos of time, but the kairos of time. And what does that mean? That this is more of how we see God operate. Why? Because God, number one, is not bound to a calendar. He is not bound to a certain time and a date in our agenda. But he operates in the fullness of time. I think the simplest example that I can give this morning is, is if you've ever been familiar with gardening. Farming is one, but even simplified in that. Is there anyone in the room that you've gardened before, that you've planted a garden? Anybody? All right, you got a garden. You see, you know that you can plant, you can plant a tomato seed, and you plant it at a certain time on a certain day. But you and I both know that you can't go seven, several weeks out or months out and say, at this exact moment, it's going to be ripe and ready for the harvest. That if you've ever gardened, you understand that it happens in the fullness of time. That if you pick the tomato on a certain day and say it should be ready and you throw it at someone and they take a bite, it may not taste as well as it should because it is not ripe and it is not ready. And there are times in the chronos that we want things to happen, but in the kairos of time, in the fullness of time, in the, in the seasons of which God operates, we may have frustration, but God is saying, I know best, and I know when things are ripe, and I know when things are ready. So if you would just trust me that in the fullness of my time, I will give you what you need, how you need it, when you need it, at the appropriate measure that you can handle it. It is the kairos of time that brings the personal revival in our lives for God to do the incredible. 
We don't have to understand it. But what we have to do is to fall to our knees in worship and say, I thought I knew, but I really didn't. I made my best preparation, but I made my best plan. I put it down and I wanted great things to happen. But Lord, if it doesn't happen, I got to trust you because you oper- because I'm operating in the chronos. But Lord, you operate in the kairos of time. We see for a short moment what's happening, but God sees totally the future that he has for us. And he knows best. It's where our trust is formed. And I think that if we understand that God is not bound to a calendar, but to the fullness of time, that we can agree today that there are things that we want God to do chronologically that we're truly not prepared for. God, bless me with this. Bless me with that. Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But we may not be ready. As if our only position in this human life is to sit back and ask God to give me, give me, give me. What if he gave us everything that we asked for? What if he did that? But what about the moments when you've asked for something, but you don't see God operating, but all of a sudden what he has for you happens, and you know this is perfect and this is right. And the different things in our life and what we desire, I think harvest is what's at the culmination of all of it. I don't think there's anyone sitting under the sound of my voice this morning that says, you know what, I I don't want to be blessed. I don't want God to smile on my life. And none none of us are going to say that. We all want God to show up and to show out in our lives. Every one of us want that. I want it as an individual. I want it for our church. But I think it's important to understand that the way that God operates isn't always on our calendar, but we have to make sure that we're working hard to give God an opportunity that if the Kairos and the Kronos could operate, if they can meet up in, those, in that moment when they happen at the same time, it's an incredible miracle. But Lord, if it doesn't happen when I want to, as long as it happens when you're ready for it to, for it to happen to us, I'm good with that. I want God to operate in his fullness, in the time that he sees appropriate, and in the season that he knows is best. We don't like that. Can we just agree this morning that it's not fun for us? We're so used to everything that we want happening quickly. I mean, you no longer have to, we don't have to wait for many things at all. And if we end up having to wait, it drives us crazy. But in the waiting is some of the best opportunity for God to show himself faithful to us. And it's also a great time for us to show ourselves faithful to him. That you start praying, God, I thought you would show, God, where, and you start saying your name. You're like, you know, there have been times in my life when I pray to God, I said, God, this is Johnny. And I felt like his response was Johnny who? And there's those moments where you feel like God's not listening or he doesn't care. But if we know the word, we know that's just simply not true. That God has always been there. He's he's never left us, never forsaken us, never hung us out to dry. He's always been there. And in our moment of desperation, it's okay to cry out to him when it doesn't happen in our plan and it doesn't happen in our timing. It's okay because in the fullness of time when it happens, you'll be more thankful, more appreciative, and it'll go from praise and it'll go to worship. See, in praise, you thank him for what he's done. In worship, you love him no matter what has happened. See, praise thanks him for your shoes. But worship says, if I don't have any shoes, I'm going to worship you. Praise thanks him for the house you have. Worship says, if I don't have a house. It's a difference of mindset. And when we worship him that way, we understand his timing, though we may not understand it, is always perfect. We don't get it. We don't understand it all the time. And today I want to look over, the ser- over this series, I want to take in the context of a passage in the book of Hosea. It's an Old Testament. He's an Old Testament prophet. And in the book of Hosea, chapter 10, as you find yourself there, we're going to look at verse 12 and break that down over the next series, uh, over the next series of weeks. And today I want to focus on one phrase in this text this morning. Now, to give you a little backdrop of the history of Hosea, Hosea is a man of God, a prophet of God, who God calls to marry a harlot named Gomer. Now, I've met many women named Gomer uh, in our present day. But, uh, but if it's your name, this is the Bible, we're not talking about you, all right? 
So God tells Hosea to marry Gomer, and he pays a price for her that no one else was willing to pay. And he loves her, gives to her, blesses her, and she still returns to a life that was dishonoring. And then God tells him to go get her again. And he's teaching Hosea. He's saying, you know what? You want to prophesy to the nation of Israel, but I want you to feel what I feel. I want you to catch just a glimpse of what I feel whenever I have given, whenever I have provided, when I've been better than they deserve. And they walk back to worshiping other things that are going to destroy them. So I want you to understand. I want you to catch just a glimpse. Hosea is faithful, long-suffering, and patient. And God speaks to him in the context and the opportunity to see God restore the nation of Israel. So... Hosea, in this context, is sharing a word with them that God desires for them to hear. And here's what it says. It says in verse 12, it says, So righteousness for yourselves. So I want you to understand it's about time. He says, so. And he says, reap the fruit of unfailing love. So there's a sowing and there is a reaping. That's all we need to understand, that we can chronologically do both. We can chronologically sow, but it's in the fullness of time that we reap. And he says in the end of that, he says, And break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. When? Until He comes. You can't put timing on that. It's like you say to, it's like we can never say to God, hey, I'm going to pray three weeks and four days for my child to come home and to have a radical encounter with you. No, you pray till when? Till it comes. You pray until it happens. You pray until God has given the opportunity and you get to see the miracle take place. It says, for it is time. He says, it's about time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. Just one verse, but so powerful. So I want to kind of give you a little bit of history and background to this, because in short, two verses before this, the two verses describe Israel, because that's who Hosea is talking to, the nation of Israel. They have a violent history of which now relies on military power for security. And he references a city called Gibeah. And Gibeah symbolizes this trait because it was the capital city of which Saul reigned. And Gibeah is set up as a fortress behind walls that they can accurately defend themselves. So they had relied upon their fortress. They had relied upon their city. Okay, so what it's saying to them is that, Israel, you think you're safe behind the walls that you had. You think you're safe because of your military power. You think that you're safe because of the city in which you dwell. But he was teaching them this, that God will punish them for their two sins. One of apostasy. What does that mean? It means that they worship the calves of Baal while desiring the blessing of God. Now, I want you to understand this. That in the Old Testament, Israel never completely quit worshiping Yahweh. Because they wanted the blessing of Yahweh while they enjoyed the pleasures of idolatry. So they would worship Baal in their pleasure, but then turn to God in their desperation. I think there are times in our life where we do that. It's when we get sidetracked. When God has been so faithful to us and all of a sudden we turn our attention to things that we know are going to derail us. But then all of a sudden when the derailment happens, what do we do? We become desperate and we cry out to Yahweh again. The nation of Israel is no different than humanity today. We want God in our convenience. We want, we want, we want pleasure. We want the idolatry in our convenience. And we want God in our desperation. And God's saying, I'm the God of it all. I'm the God of the blessing, and I'm the God of the... Tra I can bless you. I can be there in tragedy. But whenever I show up in tragedy and restore and redeem you, don't turn away from me in your season of blessing. There are times when we get so sidetracked because the thing we've been praying for comes. And then we forget the one who gave it to us. We start praying, God, will you bless me? Will you, pour will you open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing I don't have room enough to contain? What does that even look like? I don't know. I had not figured it out yet. But I do know this, that if he brings it to me, it must be in the timing he trusts me to be faithful with it. 
And then if he doesn't give it to me, then Lord, I'm not, if I'm not ready to receive it, don't give it to me. Because the very thing that I want may ruin me. We want success. Lord, give me success. Well, when we learn what proper success looks like, maybe the Lord will give it to us. But we want it when we want it, how we want it. And so Israel, they are worshiping the calves of Baal while desiring the blessing of God. And then, so their sin of apostasy, but then they had a sin of, of militarism, which means that they relied on their strength instead of the power of God. Think about it. If you're familiar with Old Testament history at all, there were times where God allowed them to win battles they should have never won. And then there were times that they lost battles they should have never lost. They won the ones that God showed up because they relied on Him. They lost the ones they should have won because they relied on their own ability. And in our lives, what will happen from time to time is we become very confident on who we are and what we have. We begin to hide, instead of going to God out of desperation for every moment of our lives, we start saying, uh, if, you, if you've ever been in a place where you, you didn't have two nickels to rub together, then all of a sudden God blesses you. Isn't it easier to trust God whenever you got 20000 in a savings account? And so you start thinking, ah, it's no big deal. I, I can cover that. Whatever God say, no, 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 I have plans for what I bless you with. I want you to use what I bless you. And you become confident you will lose what you have confidence in if it robs the position that I should have in your life. Well, you know what? I've been going to church my whole life, so my family will be good. As long as I go to church, everything's going to be all right. He's saying, yeah, you can go. You can go to church, but you can't. But I'm not calling you to go to church. I'm calling you to be the church. And you think because you go that everything's going to work out? No. If you'll be the church, then my principles, my values will always reign supreme in your life. And you won't be someone that does. You'll be someone that is being. And you are called to be men and women women that represent my name in the fullest capacity. And I will bless you. And I will bless you in my timing, in my way. So don't rely on your own strength. Don't rely on your own power. And don't rely on your own blessing. You've got to seek me. Why? Because the enemy will come. The enemy will come. So they lost battles. And so the enemy comes and and, and traps the nation behind the walls that they felt safe in. We can no longer sit behind the walls of a church and think everything's going to be okay when we don't simply engage the enemy outside of these walls. It's about time. It's about time for God to do great things in our life. Do you think God desires to see you desolate? To see you not whole? To see your identity shifted in a way that you no longer know who you are? Do you think that's God's plan for your life? Do you think it's God's plan for our lives that we wouldn't know direction, we wouldn't know our left from our right, and we would have no moral compass? Is that really God's plan? No. But how do we operate the time that God wants us to? And I want to look at this passage. I want to look at this verse. Because number one, I want us to understand that I believe with all of my heart that God comes to a prepared place. God comes to a prepared place. We ask God to give things that we are not prepared for. What if God gave you exactly what you wanted at the moment you asked for it, regardless if you were prepared? Have there ever been times that God did something in your life you weren't prepared for? Yes. But most of the time, He gives it to me and I go, wow, I wasn't expecting that, but that's incredible. But I've seen quite the opposite of things that I desire that God didn't give me in that moment because He knew that I wasn't ready. And we do things like ask God for more when we've not been faithful with what we already have. God comes to a prepared place. He says what? It is time, what, to seek the Lord. It's time to what? To sow righteousness. It's time to reap unfailing love. If we do what? If we break up the hard ground. So first, I believe God comes to a prepared place. I believe before God ever pours out the miracle, we got to be preparing to receive it. We got to be, we're asking God, but we're not preparing for it. We have to prepare for it. Number two, I think it's important that when we pray and ask God to do things in timing, that we put our hands to the plow. Then we don't ask God to bless us while we sit on our couch and become lazy. Well, you missed a good chance to say amen there. 
Then we say, God, I wish you, if you do this, God's going to give me, God's going to give me, God's going what to. What if God may bless you, but he's not, trying to, he's not trying to form a spoiled brat mentality in your life? That you don't ever have to do anything? So what do we do? We work as if it depends on us, and we pray as we know everything depends on God. That we don't become complacent and comfortable with where we are and what's happening because we put our hand to the plow because God doesn't want us to ignore our responsibility. See, Hosea declared that no matter how good conditions were for the growing, no matter how good the conditions were for the planting, that Israel would not bear fruit because they had been worshiping and idolatry and, and counting on their own strength, that Israel wasn't ready to reap the harvest. No matter how much they thought they were, he was saying, it's time for you to put your hands back to the plow and get your focus right. I think it's important for us as well. I think it's important for us to understand that God comes in a prepared place, but he also wants us to put our hand to the plow. And then where I want to focus the rest of this morning at, I think it's important that when he says that I want you to break up the hardened places. Another version says to break up the fallow ground. What the commentaries have translated it down to is he says, I want you to remove your superstitions and vices and be renewed. If you understand anything about farming, it's the reason that you don't see farmers go out and plant on soil that has not been tilled. What if fields were grown up with weeds and all kinds of other stuff, and all of a sudden the farmer runs out and throws seed down and goes, I don't know what happened. I don't know why it didn't grow. I mean, I hadn't cut the, I haven't put the, cut the weeds out. I haven't even prepared the field, but I threw seed down and the harvest should have happened. But the truth about it is, is we can scatter seed and hope that something good happens, or we can scatter seed on a ground that we have worked and we have tilled and we have prepared for God to move in. When he says to break up your fallow ground, it means this. It means break up the hardened places that are taking advantage of the opportunity that God wants to. To give. So we have to ask ourselves this question What are the hardened things that can be linked to us not walking in fullness? Well, maybe it's something as simple as what someone has said about us. As we believe that biblically it says the power of life and death is in the tongue. So when people say things about us, can it allow hardness to happen in our lives? If someone says, you know what, you are foolish, or you are dumb, or you are ugly, or you are stupid, or you will never make it, or you don't have what it takes. Maybe it came from a parent. Maybe it came from a trusted friend. Maybe it came from peers. I don't know, but I do know this. That's what people say about us doesn't have to define us because what they say is from a limited knowledge. But what does God say about us? Does God ever look at you and say, you are a fool? No. Does God ever look at you and say, you are a failure? No. So what do we have to do? These things that have hardened our heart and hardened our lives, we have to put a plow, we have to put the plow in our hands and break those things up. And we have to till the ground so that when the Lord reigns the righteousness, we can receive it. Because so many times God is saying great things to us, but we're not prepared to receive it because we are disheartened or we are distracted. And we don't believe the things that God wants to do in our lives because we are messed up. See, we're delivered, but we're damaged. We come to Christ with a past that he has forgiven us of, but sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. And the way that people have labeled us carries a lot of power. And Israel has rejected God time and time again. And if God loves Israel, then how much more than would he love us? That he gave his only son, that we would not have to live in rejection, but to live in acceptance so that we know that he accepted us, so he's going to restore us. Maybe it's something someone said about us. Maybe it's what we believe about ourselves, our identity. That we think that everyone else deserves it but us. Can I tell you that God knows the numbers of the hairs, count it, and He counts them one by one on your head. And if you're bald this morning, He still knows. Like, well, He don't have to count along with me. But maybe you think that you think things about yourself that are untrue. Your self-esteem. You walk into a room and think that everyone hates you. Or you think they're talking about you. You think that it's cliquish and no one loves you. It's a hard place. 
It's a place of rejection that we've never dealt with. I walk through it from time to time with identity. Man, who, God, you call me to be this, but it's so different than what I... Maybe it's the emotions that we hang on to because of the hurt of our past. Maybe that is the hardened ground. This morning, no matter what it is, whether past relationships, someone that has tried to ruin you, someone that has said evil about you, maybe it's a decision that you've made. Maybe it's a decision that you walked in. I, I don't know. And I don't have time this morning to go one by one by one by one on a soapbox of things, but I got to trust the maturity of everyone in this room this morning to understand that God has a harvest He wants to reap in our life. He wants to sow seed in our life and He wants to reap a harvest. But the condition of our heart is important in it. Are we hardened? Are we calloused? Because of something that has happened. It's like we haven't been able to push through. I don't know why my family's going through I don't know why church doesn't feel this. I don't know why I can't worship. I don't know why. As if God's saying, I want your worship to be jacked up so you can't love on me. I want your family to be dysfunctional so it can't honor me. I want... But what happens is we allow hardness and hurt and past and transgressions and our own ideologies and our own worldviews to distract us from the harvest that God wants to bring in our lives. And I would say this morning, it's about time. It's about time that we stop making excuses and we put our hand to the plow and we realize the hardened places in our lives and we till it up so that when God begins to pour out His blessing, we can receive it. How many of you this morning would say, if God wants to bless my life, I want to receive it? Two of you, all three of us then this morning, we'll have an opportunity to put our hands to a plow and say, I'm going to work and I'm going to put my hand to the plow and break up the hard places. That I'm not going to let bitterness and rejection refuse me an opportunity to have God shower righteousness and unfailing love in my life. Because no matter how much seed he throws, if we haven't broke up the hard places, like, Pastor, I don't get it. I don't understand. It's so difficult for me. I don't know how to do this. I'm not saying that you know how, but you just trust that it's right and you start. And for each one of us, it will be different. Our emotions, the hard places, the fallow ground, the superstitions, the vices, the, well, I woke up and the sun was shining. It must be. Can I tell you that if it's storming and lightning outside, God's still going to bless you. If we don't dictate our blessing based on outside circumstances, we dictate our blessing on our unique connectedness through the person of Jesus Christ to a God in heaven that wants to bless His children. And that blessing may not look like a bank account that gives you the opportunity to reject Him. It may look like a life that wants to honor Him and be faithful in your time, your talent, and your treasure. Because to me, that looks a lot more like success than arrogance and self-sustaining. As if God is our co-pilot. So we break up the hard places. So what God desires to do. In this simple passage, Hosea breaks it down for us. So today as we stand, I want to close and I want to remind you of some simple things. Stand with me today. But I want you to walk away understanding I want you to walk away understanding it's about time. His timing, not just ours. That we can chronologically plan things out, but it's in the fullness of time that it happens. You want a child right now. Yeah, you may plan that. You may want that. But in the fullness of time, it'll happen. You may want a promotion, but it may be that promotion would distract you from your destiny. You may want God to pour out, but what if that thing distracted you from what God desires for you to have? Don't trust your timing. Trust His. It's about time. It's about understanding that God sees the past, the present, and the future all in the same. And if He is omniscient and He is omnipotent, then why don't we fall more in love with the one that knows how to do everything instead of relying on the one that knows partially? It's about time. And the second thing I want you to leave with today is it's time to break up the hard places. What are you hanging on to? Some of us hang on to things that happened five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, two weeks ago, four days ago. And we're hanging on to things with shackles. 
wanting freedom to be sown in our lives. But we can't receive freedom when we're a slave. So we want to be not be a slave to bondage. We want to be a slave to righteousness. So what do we do? We set ourselves free by coming to Christ and saying, Lord, break up the hard places in my heart, of my life, where I've lost faith, where I don't see, where I'm not optimistic anymore. Lord, I want to, I want to put my hand to the plow and I want to till up the soil so that you can sow seeds of righteousness in my life. Why? Because it's what He desires. He desires to bless you. So we got to break up the hard places. And last, I want you to know that once we have established the timing and we've broken up the hard places, that it's time to let Him come and to plant in our lives. Why? Because He wants us to be whole and He wants us to be healthy. What does health look like? Does it mean that you'll never get a bug? Does it mean you'll never get a sickness? No. He wants you to be healthy that no matter what this world brings, you know who you are. And you know what you're to do and you know who you're going to serve. And you choose this day because you've broken up hard places and you allow God to work in ways that you've never seen before. Can he sow in your life? Is your soil ready to receive the seed that he wants to plant into you? Every head bowed, every eye closed.